inviting me and making this possible. It's been an honor. I want to begin my discussion of Locke's notion of the relation of property to life with a brief passage from a work written 300 years before the publication of the two treatises of government. I hope in this way to make visible the un not the underlying coherence and unity of his argument, but the specific conflict that makes the text what it is. Near the beginning of the last part, or passus, of William Langland's Pierce Plowman, we find the following passage. And need hath no law, nor never shall fall in debt, for the things he taketh is life for to save. I cite this passage not only because it represents in the form of an allegory the debates concerning the rights of the poor to subsistence that occupied the church for some centuries, involving such diverse figures as Aquinas and Occam, but even more because it offers a particular translation of a Roman adage of very obscure origin, necessitas non habet legem, uh, which is typically translated not the way that Langland translates it, as need has no law, but rather as necessity has no law. Okay. Uh, in fact, the phrase has been understood in opposition to Langland's interpretation, which is the interpretation that was probably current in the Middle Ages, okay, by a series of 20th century, 21st century commentators, from Schmidt to Agamben, as capturing the fact that the sovereign power must operate in the realm of necessity, or necessary force, unrestrained by the legal order it seeks to preserve or restore. Clearly, Locke's political philosophy in its entirety opposes such a position by installing law in nature prior to any human legislation, a law coextensive with the use of reason itself and thus immediately knowable and as such enforceable. And the law of nature is above all formulated as a right of ownership. Killing an individual is first and foremost a violation of his rights as proprietor of his own person, just as the expropriation of what he has mixed his labor with and thus annexed to himself, and these are Locke's expressions, not mine. Okay. Um, above all, in Locke's text, the food necessary to his existence is not simply an attempt on what is his property, but on what is proper to him, that originary and essential prosthesis without which his existence is inconceivable. The sovereign who disregards the law of nature is thus less a leviathan said by God to chasten and terrify the children of pride than the figure of the inhuman, a man who has, quote, become degenerate, unquote, as a, quote, lion or tiger, one of those wild, savage beasts with whom men can have no society nor security, and upon this is grounded that great law of nature, unquote. The necessity that requires a suspension of law for Locke, then, is nothing more than the machine-like operation of predatory animals, incapable of obeying any law other than that of the promptings of the body. Indeed, Roberto Esposito has shown that for Locke, the sovereign power has no other legitimate function than the protection of the property that is a man's own life, and the life that through labor ceaselessly converts the things around him into himself not so much interiorizing or even annexing these things as transmuting them indistinguishably into his very being. Thus, when Locke declares, quote, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions, unquote, he resorts to the highly unusual construction, quote, to harm a man in his blank, in order not simply to render life and possessions equivalent, but to suggest that to take another man's possessions, and let's note that possession, mere possession and ownership, are not and cannot be the same for law, represents an attack on or a subtraction from a man's physical, corporeal existence, which, as we've seen, cannot be reduced to the human body alone. And while Locke initially holds that in the state of nature, pun the punishment meted out to the violator of natural law must be, quote, proportionate to his transgression, 
and carried out in order, quote, to make him repent the doing of it and thereby deter him and by his example others from doing the like mischief, unquote, he soon exempts the victim of even petty theft from such restrictions. Thus, quote, I may kill a thief when he sets on me but to rob me of my horse or coat because the law which was made for my preservation where it cannot interpose to secure my life from present force, which if lost is capable of no reparation, permits me my own defense and the right of war, a liberty to kill the aggressor, because the aggressor allows not time to appeal to our common judge, nor the, to the decision of law for remedy in a case where the mischief, mischief may be irreparable." Unquote. Locke's argument here, that when I'm directly exposed, without the physical protection of an agent of the law, to those actions on the part of the thief necessary to the accomplishment of the theft, I am in his absolute power and could be killed by him, has the effect of rendering every act of theft, of uh, a theft from one's person, pickpocketing, for example, which might indeed involve, quote, setting on, it's a very ambiguous uh, phrase, okay, setting on the victim by jostling, grabbing, or pushing him, a potential attempt on his life which can and indeed should immediately be punished by death. Even the use of the term thief is significant here. It allows Locke to avoid specifying where the thief is, whether the thief is a man, a woman, or a child, young or old, strong or weak, and therefore the extent to which the thief actually poses or can pose a threat to my existence. Moreover, the proximity of my horse or coat to my body the fact that they are mine in the sense that, to use the language introduced in chapter 5 of the second treatise, I have annexed them to me, means that they are now a kind of prosthetic extension of my body in the absence of which I am not the person I was when I possessed them. The second treatise thus moves not only in the sequence of its arguments, but in the illustrations and images designed to help us picture the arguments, to problematize and interfere with every attempt to separate the notions of myself my life and my property, finally, finally rendering them equivalent and indiscernible. It is this fact that allows us to understand Locke's definition of, quote, political power as the right of making laws with penalties of death, and consequently all less penalties, for the regulating and preserving of property, unquote, as something other than an abandonment of the responsibilities normally associated, or traditionally associated with government. The verb preserve and the noun preservation occur together 21 times in the second treatise. In 19 of the 21 cases, they refer to life, that is, the self-preservation of an individual or the preservation of the species. Locke allows, or rather compels us, to read the preservation of one's property as part of self-preservation, not only because the definition of every man as a proprietor of himself eliminates any distinction between the property and the propertyless, given that every individual owns at least his own person, which thus gives every human being a stake in the defense of property in a larger sense, but also because appropriation, the transmutation of what is not mine, what is originally common but not yet appropriated into my property and thus myself, is not simply a change of ownership, but a transformation necessary to life itself of which uh, the images which he offers briefly of ingestion and digestion are simply the most salient examples. But this expanded sense of the preservation of property, which is the sole end of government, itself rests precariously on the fault lines that Locke's own argument opens. If government exists to defend individuals understood as the rightful proprietors of their own lives, as well as their own goods, from those who would take one or the other in violation both of that, quote, original law of nature, unquote, and of the, quote, positive laws to determine property, unquote, made and multiplied by mankind. It must also defend their freedom, quote, to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. Indeed, the limitations on private accumulation that Locke proposes very famously in chapter 5 do not refer in any way to the desires or more to the point to the needs of any other man. 
but only to the extent to which what is appropriated by an individual can be consumed and made part of his being. That original law of nature, the preservation of which is coextensive with the self-preservation of the individual, cannot provide a justification for requiring an individual to give up what may now or in the future be used for the support and maintenance of his being to another man. But this does not mean that the individual in question, at least, quote, when his preservation comes not in competition, unquote, does not do his part, quote, as much as he can to preserve the rest of mankind, unquote. He does so by leaving or abandoning what he himself cannot use now or in the future, that is, what will, if it remains in his possession, spoil, for others to appropriate as they, as they can, allowing them the chance through their labor to annex, ingest, and digest the food necessary to their preservation. Thus, the law of nature, according to Locke, does no more than forbid the individual to waste what others might possibly consume, just as he is forbidden to take their lives or property. But he is under no enforceable obligation to feed them, and is immunized against their claims to whatever food he possesses that will not spoil, in the same way that the needs of the coatless man in the English winter cannot justify his, quote, harming another in his possessions, unquote even if what he takes is necessary to his self-preservation and superfluous to his victim. Need, therefore, for Locke is always subject to law, if only the original law of nature, a law that because it precedes and founds positive law as its condition, a law that is not made but discovered by the industrious and the rational, cannot be suspended and suffers no exceptions whether from above, in the case of, the, of absolute sovereignty, or below, in the case of those, the majority in Locke's world, without any property other than their own person. We cannot fully appreciate the extravagance and hyperbolic nature of the arguments concerning the mutual imminence of life and property in the individual without understanding the extent to which Locke stands in opposition to his contemporaries such as Spinoza and Malbranche, for whom the very notion of, quote, one's own self, the self of which alone we are conscious when we think and simultaneously perceive we are thinking, was demonstrably false, an illusion of autonomy and freedom from others that flattered our pride and made us acutely susceptible to the contagion that is the reproduction or transmission of affects or passions from others which were all the more powerful in that we mistakenly believe them to be our own, originating and contained in us. For these other philosophers, passions and images pass so freely between persons that the question of whether what passes in my own mind is mine or somebody else's became an insoluble problem, calling into question the very notion of, quote, a man's own mind, and thus the proprietary relation between me and what I call mine or my own. Etienne Balibar's comment that for Locke, quote, the thematic of the own, owning, and ownership entails a parallelism of responsibility and property, of self-consciousness and property in itself, allows us to understand the importance of the body for Locke, not, not just as a manifestation of life, but as the corporeal guarantee of the separation of consciousnesses and therefore of persons. I can only perceive and form ideas on the basis of the sensations felt by my body, that is the body I alone inhabit and no one else's. If I am accountable for the actions of my body, as Locke says, even if I am asleep, he reads, like everybody's very interested in sleepwalking in that period. Uh, okay, e even if when I'm asleep or drunk, uh, and therefore, quote, not myself, and Locke notes the, the use of that expression. It is because my body is my own and no one else's, a fact that is simultaneously biological or physical and legal and even theological. Indeed, it is possible to argue that the doctrine of property developed in the first five chapters of the Second Treatise of Government paradoxically depends upon, even as it logically precedes, the concept of personal identity Locke offers in chapter 27 of the essay concerning human understanding. For if ownership, of my ownership of my body, the body I act, as he says, direct, 
in both senses of own, that is, I acknowledge the body mine and I am its proprietor, is the foundation of all subsequent appropriation. The condition of such ownership is the continual life of the body, without which, at least until the resurrection, there can be no consciousness, no self, no person. It is this fact that gives primacy to what we might call the act of living or self-preservation, not simply the involuntary movements of respiration or the circulation of blood, but those voluntary actions by which an individual procures the nourishment and shelter without which the body cannot remain animate. What I have here termed procuring, that is, not simply ingesting nourishment, but first obtaining what is to be ingested, is both a physical act and a political act, an appropriation which, beyond the simple fact that what I procure for my survival is something I happen to have in my possession, confers a right upon me, the right of proprietorship. To support our being, our life, we must appropriate the fruits that by nature, that, sorry, the fruits that nature provides by, quote, joining and annexing them to our body. But while for Locke, quote, he that is nourished by the acorns he picked up under an oak has certainly appropriated them to himself, unquote, the process of appropriation which occurs through and in the body, which being separate from all other bodies, as consciousness is separate from all other consciousnesses, and the person from all other persons, simultaneously involves the exclusion of all other bodies, consciousnesses, and persons. To follow Ballybar's argument about the parallelism of responsibility and property, we can say that consciousness in its vital unity with the body both, quote, owns and imputes to itself past actions for which the person alone is accountable for man and God, and over which the person alone has right of proprietorship. In this way, the very act of living produces a double exclusion. Just as another person, by virtue of the incommunicability of consciousnesses and bodies, cannot share in the guilt or innocence attached to my actions, my own actions, Locke loves to repeat my own, so that the person cannot share in what I have, uh, sorry, so the person cannot share in what I have through the actions of my body appropriated and annexed to myself. The commons, the idea that the fruits of nature belong to everyone and thus no one, is literally then an impossibility given the fact that appropriation and annexation are necessary to the support of life, the life of the individual person. There could be no property without life and no life without property. This is, of course, an early version of the so-called tragedy of the commons, but if anything, a more violent and threatening version. The commons is not an original sharing of what God has given to all mankind for law, but the exclusion of the exclusion necessary to life, and therefore a preemptive expropriation of all that is proper to the person. Henceforth, life will, itself will be a struggle by a self that thinks and feels as it will be judged alone to annex what is common and to exclude both the rights and consciousness of others. The original law of nature is thus not simply given in nature and in this way placed beyond any human attempt to repeal or revoke it. It is natural in the sense that it is vital. The expression and manifestation of the action of self-preservation the preservation of the body in which reason is incarnate and incarcerated, the property in which one's own self is, is both protected and imprisoned. This is our natural condition in relation to which the endurance of the commons could only be a threat to life and thus unnatural. Yeah, I'm not over yet. Is that okay? Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Going all the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, this isn't, this isn't one of those. Time That's not what your email says. Anyway. <laughs> well, no, 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 but it's the only way that I can discipline you before the fact. Then... <laughs> well, you did a good job. I'm <laughs> feeling guilty. Okay, good. Right. But, but I'm over here. <laughs> At this point, uh, I'm tempted to quote a line from the first treatise, and uh, people who study law know that uh, the second treatise gets about 80 to 90 percent of the commentary in the first treatise is often overlooked and so it's boring. Well, boring or it's about scripture, it's the argument with Filmer, who's not 
uh, interested. In. Yeah, he is interested, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm tempted to quote a line from the first treatise in which Locke cautions the reader after a sustained examination of Filmer's text that, quote, we have been so long detained, not by the force of arguments and opposition, but by the intricacy of, wor of the words and the doubtfulness of the meaning, unquote. I'm turning lock on himself. So. <laughs> uh, it's unfair of that. But we wouldn't have stopped you before you did that. <laughs> Thus, if it is clear that the sovereign cannot suspend the law of nature, property expressed in the very act of self-preservation in the name of necessity, given that the law establishing property is inseparable from the necessity that governs life itself, the case of the man in need, in dire or vital need, who lives among the civilized, where everything has been divided up, as it should be for Locke, among legitimate owners, is very in question, very much in question. Locke will openly defy absolute monarchs who presume to violate the natural and inalienable rights of their subjects by taxing them against their will, no matter how small the tax and how substantial the holdings of those who must pay it, because theft is theft. But the problem of the destitute, above all those not maintained by the voluntary charity of the prosperous, a population whose numbers increased substantially during Locke's lifetime, and led him to devote significant thought to the problem of the poor in his last years, appears only fleetingly, half represented and at the margins of the second treatise, the coatless man, the savages shivering in the wilderness of the new world, whose images merge with those of the improvident villagers who depend on the commons for food, fuel, and lumber. These are the quarrelsome and the contentious, his phrases, who resist the appropriation of what they mistakenly regard as their land by the industrious and the rational, to whom Locke insists God gave it. If according to Langland's version of one of the positions in the medieval debates about the relation of property to life, the law or right of property cannot apply to the man who is starving, who in taking uh, what he must, quote, his life or to save, unquote, is thus neither a thief nor a criminal in any sense, we can say with reasonable certainty that Locke's argument in the second treatise excludes any such possibility. There can be no life without nourishment, and no nourishment without individual appropriation of the source of nourishment that transforms it both legally and physically. In appropriating an apple from what God has given mankind in common, that's his favorite example, is the apple. Uh, Locke's individual both joins something of his own, of his own self to the apple, and annexes it to his own self, of which it becomes a part even prior to ingestion. The fact that the appropriation, quote, without which the common is of no use, unquote, precisely excludes the claims of others, is underscored in Locke's text by his exclusive use of solitary individuals to illustrate the natural right of property. He that is nourished by the acorns, he picked up under an oak. The fruit or venison, which nourishes the wild Indian. And, I was just noticing this uh, this morning, the needy man is even one needy man, no more. The absence of others allows Locke to avoid the problem of what, if anything, is due to the others from all that I have appropriated and made my own, and under what conditions. And the spoliation clause that appears later in chapter 5 addresses this problem so obliquely that it merely defers it. What happens when my property and food, unspoiled and unlikely to spoil anytime soon, meets need, the need of another for food, which if unmet, will bring about his death? Is it, it is possible to compose a response from Locke's text, uh, which is not entirely logical, but part historical. The state of nature, as it appears in chapter 5, is bountiful. Okay, and there's a reason for it's not Locke's state, it's not, sorry, it's not Hobbes' state of nature. No one is willing, no one who is willing to exert himself in labor will go hungry. In his later essay on the poor law, 1697, 
seven years later, he uses the same words to describe the England of his time. Quote, the multiplying of the poor, he tells us, the all too apparent increase in the number of vagrants and beggars has, quote, proceeded neither from the scarcity of provisions, and he doesn't mention price of provisions, which is the absolutely determinative question, okay, <laughs> nor want of employment for the poor, since the goodness of God has blessed these times with plenty, unquote. Instead, he holds, their numbers have been increased by virtue of an unfortunate, quote, relaxation of discipline and corruption of manners, unquote. Those who are hungry were both provisions and employment are plentiful, are thus hungry by their own consent. It is they alone who bear the responsibility for their need. But if I am thus exempted from any responsibility to them, what would be the nature of my responsibility to the starving prior to the exemption their consent allows me to claim that we can go that far for Locke? Locke does not entirely avoid this question. Although by responding to it in the first treatise, specifically chapter four of Adam's title to sovereignty by donation, he isolates it from the discussions of the state of nature and the state of war, as well as the theory of property, which we have seen provides the foundation for its conception of political society. The effects of this isolation are clear. The passage has been overlooked, the passage in, in the first treatise, by some of the most penetrating readers of chapter five on property, from McPherson to Balibar and Esposito, while, at the same time, a new theological reading of Locke cites the passage from the first treatise in an attempt to connect him to medieval discussions of poverty and property by minimizing or explaining away what is most historically significant and also most disturbing about uh, Locke's version, to use Esposito's language, of the immunitary paradigm of modernity. I will neither attempt to reconcile the discussions of property in the two treatises, nor will I treat them as two poles of a contradiction. I will assume that just as the chapter of property is marked by the play of its inconsistencies and discrepancies, by what it avoids saying as much as by what it has to say, so Locke's discussion of property and need in the first treatise takes shape around the contradiction proper to it. Locke seeks to refute Filmer's argument that the earth was given by God to Adam, who as sole sovereign and proprietor passed it on to those he designated as his heirs, and they to theirs until the present time, and that this donation was the origin and foundation of all legitimate sovereignty and, for Filmer, secondarily, property. While Locke admits that God gave the world to Adam to hold as his property, I mean, it's complicated because it ends up being less about land than about his ownership of animals. Nothing good. Um, okay, but Locke uh, admits that God gave the world to Adam and his property. He asks, if by this donation of God, Adam was made sole proprietor of the whole earth, what will this be to his sovereignty? And how will it appear that propriety in land gives a man power over the life of another? Or how will the possession even of the whole earth give anyone a sovereign arbitrary authority over the persons of men? Of course, there are any number of possible arguments for a derivation of sovereignty from dominion or possession, as the experiments in colonialism, and with which Locke was very, very familiar, uh, showed. And we might expect him to acknowledge these arguments and try to refute them or whatever. Instead, his argument takes what should be a surprising turn. Locke imagines that the hypothetical proprietor of the earth might employ his natural right to dispose of his property as he sees fit, to starve or threaten to starve the others in order to extort from them submission to his absolute authority. Quote, he that is proprietor of the whole world may deny all the rest of mankind food and so at his pleasure starve them if, he will not acknowledge, if they will not acknowledge his sovereignty and obey his will. If this is still law, if this were true, it would be a good argument to prove that there never was any such property that God never gave any such private dominion, since it is more reasonable to think that God, who bid mankind increase and multiply, should rather himself give them all the right to make use of the food and raiment and other conveniences of life, the materials whereof he had so plentifully provided for them, than to make them depend upon the will of a single man for their subsistence, 
who should have the power to destroy them all when he pleased, unquote. And there are other issues there uh, about juridical power versus physical power. I don't want to get into that. While Locke's argument here points to the necessity of an original commons, paradoxically, the supersession of which, through individual appropriation, constitutes the property both of life and concurrently a political society, an origin that Filmer's argument for Adam's proprietorship of the earth displaces and calls into question, Locke quickly moves to qualify and limit the right of property on very different grounds than those of the spoli spoliation clause proposed in chapter five of the second treatise. Assuming an origin of property other than the individual laboring to satisfy his vital needs, Locke, following Filmer's argument, asserts that if property is given to man by God, the gifts cannot be given to a single proprietor for his benefit alone. Quote, the property in his peculiar portion of the things of this world, unquote, given by God to one man, not only does not exclude the right of others, but because it is given by God, must constitute simultaneously, quote, a right to the surplusage, the surplus of his goods, given his needy brother. Again, in the singular, unquote. Locke further stipulates that this right cannot justly be denied him when his pressing wants call for him, the needy man. At this point, Locke, in some sense, compromises his position by arguing against Filmer that the needy man may indeed be sub subjected to the authority of the proprietor who feeds him for his surplus, but that this subjection is purely voluntary originating neither in a natural hierarchy nor in a violent appropriation of the needy man's natural liberty, but in his consent. Quote, the authority of the rich proprietor and the subjections of the needy beggar begin not from the possession of the Lord, but from the consent of the poor man who preferred being his subject to starving. And the man he thus submits to can pretend to no more power over him than he has consented to upon compact, unquote. In this way, the man of the state, that's Locke's expression, fulfills his obligations to relieve the needy man through a contractual arrangement by which the latter is fed on the condition that he freely consents to submit to the authority of the former, who nevertheless has no more power over him than he himself has consented to upon a compact. The unequal relation that arises from this agreement is perfectly legitimate, as is the use of need to obtain through a contract the voluntary obedience and subjection of others. Locke thus not only rejects dominion as the foundation for absolute sovereignty in response to Filmer, but he shifts the onus onto the needy man who can no longer expect to be fed without conditions. If he wants to eat, he must consent to serve the man who feeds him. If he does not so consent, he then starves by his own free choice. It is here that this already elliptical passage begins to break apart under the pressure of the questions to which it leads the reader, even though it can't pose them. If the gift given to the proprietor simultaneously confers upon the needy man a right to uh, the proprietor's surplus, however it's, that's defined, is the needy man who takes food from the former supply after being refused a thief? Does the widespread refusal to feed the starving, even through a mutually beneficial compact, imply a revocation of the immunity of property owners? Is immunity granted to those who, faced with starvation, must take what the men of a state have not consented to give? Finally, and most intolerable of all for Locke, what happens when the exclusive right of property, instead of forming the basis for existence, threatens to exclude the needy from life itself. And we, we could even think about the, the word needy as a way of describing uh, it's, it's our It's almost like our modern sense of someone's very needy. In that case, as Piers the Plowman tells us, it is not simply need, but the needy who without any right to make legal declarations bring about what was later called a state of exception a suspension of law that occurs by the mere act of continuing to live. That's a 